In the previous section, we reviewed some of the properties of acids and bases that we can observe in a standard lab environment. Let's look further into the structures of acids and bases and look at some definitions so we can get a better grip of what acids and bases actually are. Uh, in the matter of acids, we have some that are called binary, in which we have what we call an acid hydrogen. In other words, a hydrogen that is going to be ionized, attached to a non-metal atom. For example, you have HCl called hydrochloric acid in here. We have another type of acid called the oxy acids. These have acid hydrogens attached to an oxygen atom. And again, when we say an acid hydrogen, we mean this is the hydrogen that will be released or ionized when the acid acts as such. Here we have sulfuric acid and nitric acid. You can see where the hydrogen that is going to be released is attached to an oxygen. Notice that in the case of sulfuric acid, we have two of them. Another type of acid, another category, are the so-called carboxylic acids, which are technically a subset of the oxy acids. In this case, what we have is a hydrogen attached to an oxygen, but that oxygen far forms part of a group that we sometimes label as COOH. So here is the structure of acetic acid. You can see both the space filling model on the right and the structural formula there on the top and uh, notice that in this case there are four hydrogens in the structure however only one of them is actually acidic in other words that hydrogen that is attached to the oxygen in the COOH group is the one that gets released uh, we have many many acids that have this group we call it the carboxylic acid group or the carboxyl group is an HOC with a double bonded O and then that carbon is connected to something else. Because of that we sometimes write for example the formula of acetic acid in this form CH3COOH. There are a myriad uh, different kinds of carboxylic acids in nature. For example citric acid which as the name suggests is part of the makeup of many citrus fruits and then malic acid, which we can find in grapes and also other fruits. Now, to try to get a definition of what an acid or a base are, we can start back in the 1800s with the model of Svante Arrhenius. And this definition relies on the question, what happens when I put the substance in water? An acid in water produces hydrogen ions, and a base in water produces hydroxide ions. You can see here with HCl and NaOH, which we saw earlier in our little demo, as they ionize to hydrogen and chloride ions or to sodium and hydroxide ions. That would be for HCl and NaOH respectively. Now, when we look at that H plus in there, that's marked in red here for HCl, what is that really? Well, think about it. Hydrogen atomic number one would have a proton and an electron, right? So if we were to say H+, plus, that means we've removed the electron and we're left with a proton? Well, uh, with, we don't really work with physically a proton. What we have in water is actually what's called a hydronium ion. It's H3O with a plus one charge. And the way to find this is by looking as if the acid is reacting with water. Like here, you can see where the HCl right, is reacting with water. Now notice that HCl is technically a molecular compound. And yet, when it is dissolved in water, because of this reaction we're showing here, it ionizes. Notice that in reality, the so-called proton or hydrogen ion is actually this hydronium ion that we are showing in here. So let's consider a reaction between an acid and a base. For example, we know that ammonia is a base because we saw that in our demo. We know that HCl is an acid. We saw it in our uh, demonstration. But 
We said both times that ammonia and HCl are actually molecular compounds. In their natural form, they're actually gases. What's interesting is that they will react in the gas phase. Here is an experiment where they are placed on two different uh, flasks. And in this case, they've been condensed to their liquid form. And when you open the valve in the middle, as the vapors, the fumes of each one, move towards each other, they react, producing a white solid powder, which is actually NH4Cl or ammonium chloride. So that tells you that you don't need water to explain acid-base reactions. The Arrhenius equation also doesn't explain exactly how ammonia produces hydroxide ions in water because ammonia doesn't have any hydroxide ion in it. Uh, it also doesn't explain why when you uh, dissolve things like ammonium carbonate or sodium oxide in water, uh, they form basic solutions. Again, they don't contain hydroxide ions. So there are several uh, things that the Arrhenius uh, equation, I'm sorry, there are several things that the Arrhenius definition, sorry, I got carried away with kinetics, does not account for in defining what acids and bases are. And so in 1923, Bronson and Lowry proposed a new definition. In their definition, an acid donates a hydrogen ion to another substance, and a base accepts a hydrogen ion from another substance. In other words, in their definition, every behavior of acids and bases uh, has to do with donating or accepting a hydrogen ion, which means that you always have to have the donor and the acceptor in your chemical equation. Notice here HCl reacting with water. Of course, we can see it as if the uh, hydrogen from HCl is being donated to the water molecule in order to create this hydronium ion. This definition explains why ammonia is a base. In the case of ammonia, water donates a hydrogen ion to the ammonia and converts it into an ammonium ion. When water loses that quote-unquote proton, it's left with that electron and so it becomes the hydroxide ion that we detected in our litmus paper and our indicator tests. So, according to the brownstead lowry definition, an acid-base reaction is one where the acid donates or transfers a hydrogen ion to a base. So, an acid-base reaction is one in which a proton is transferred. We can uh, visualize it that way. It doesn't require that water be involved. So, as we saw in our reaction between ammonia and HCl, simply in the gas phase, what is happening is that the HCl is having a rupture there. Pretend that bond is being broken. But the chlorine, I'm sorry, the chlorine is keeping those electrons, whereas the hydrogen, quote-unquote, proton is being transferred to the ammonia as the base to generate on the right the ammonium ion and the chloride ion, which because of electrostatic attraction, are going to join up and form the solid ammonium chloride. <clears throat> okay, let's do a little practice. Please look at the following equation, pause the video, and see if you can identify in this reaction who is the bronsted lowry acid and who is the bronsted lowry base. Okay, let's see what we find here. There you go, that is the answer. Why? Because in this reaction, as you can see, the water is donating a hydrogen to the OCl minus, this is, this is actually called the hypochlorite ion, to form HOCl, which is hypochlorous acid. In this particular reaction, the water acts as an acid, and the hypochlorite ion accepts a hydrogen from the water, therefore, it is the base. Feel free to pause the video and go through that again and make sure you understand what is going on. Notice that in this reaction, one way to visualize it from the equation is ask the question, 
Who is losing a hydrogen? That's the acid. Who is acquiring a hydrogen? That's the base. Now, some acid-base reactions are reversible. And we've studied reversible reactions in the previous unit. And we know that eventually the system arrives at a state of equilibrium. So let's look at the following equation as written from left to right. Now imagine this reaction going in the reverse direction from right to left. If that were the case, in that direction, what would be the acid and what would be the base? I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about that. Okay. As you can see, going from right to left, the fluoride ion is the one accepting a hydrogen to become HF. So that's the base. <clears throat> and the HCO3 minus ion or bicarbonate ion is donating that hydrogen. And so it's losing a hydrogen. And therefore, in going from right to left, the HCO3 minus ion would be the acid. Now, whenever we have a reaction like this one, which is reversible, we say that uh, the products of the reaction are going to be the conjugates of the base and the acid that form them. So, for example, in this reaction between hydrofluoric acid and the carbonate ion, of course, from left to right, HF is the hydrogen donor, so it's the acid, and the carbonate ion is the base or the hydrogen acceptor. We already saw that in the reverse direction, the fluoride ion is the base. So we would say that the HF and the F- minus would form a conjugate pair. HF would be the acid. F- minus would be the conjugate base of that acid. Notice that the only difference between them is one hydrogen. Now, on the other hand, you have the carbonate ion from left to right acting as a base. But if you go in the opposite direction, the product of that would be the bicarbonate ion, HCO3-, and from right to left, that one behaves as an acid. So we would say that HCO3- is the conjugate acid of the carbonate ion. Again, notice they only differ by one hydrogen. That's very important. The conjugate acid and base pair differs only by one proton or one hydrogen. So. In the case of the acid, phosphoric acid, H3PO4, we would say that its conjugate base is H2PO4 minus, which is the dihydrogen phosphate ion, not the phosphate ion itself, which would differ from phosphoric acid by three hydrogens, not by one. Now, one of the things you may have noticed in some of these reactions is that sometimes water was acting as the acid or proton donor. Sometimes it was acting as the base, the proton acceptor. So a substance that can act as either an acid or a base is called an amphoteric substance. Water is perhaps the most common amphoteric substance. Another very common one is the bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. Okay. Please look at the following two reactions, and let's see in which of those is the bicarbonate acting as an acid, and in which one is it acting as a base. And since these are both reversible, let's see if you can identify who are the conjugates in each one of these reactions. I'll give you a few moments to think about it, pause the video, and then come back. Okay, here we go. Yes, see, in the top reaction, bicarbonate is donating a proton to the hydroxide ion, converting it into water. Therefore, bicarbonate is acting as the acid. <clears throat> and the product of losing that hydrogen, the, con the carbonate ion, CO3, to negative, is its conjugate base. Now, look at the one below. In this reaction below, the bicarbonate is accepting a hydrogen to become H2CO3. So therefore, in this reaction, correct, the bicarbonate is acting as a base. 
and the H2CO3 is its conjugate acid. Notice that water is the conjugate of both the hydroxide ion and the hydronium ion. But depending on which reaction you're in, the water is going to be either the conjugate acid of hydroxide ions or the conjugate base of hydronium ions. And this will play a major role later on when we study a very interesting property of water in solutions. Now, one of the things we found in our uh, little demos was that, was that when we did the conductivity experiment, uh, some uh, acids and some bases, in our particular case vinegar and ammonia, did not give us a lot of ions in solution. They produce ions but in a low amount. And we would say that this is the difference between what we call strong and weak acids and bases. It doesn't have to do with whether they're very concentrated or not. It has nothing to do with the molarity. It has to do with the extent of ionization. Strong acids and bases ionize completely. Weak acids and bases ionize to only a small extent. Small fraction of the molecules actually ionize. So let's look at strong acids here. Strong acids are strong electrolytes, as we saw with HCl. Now, I gave you a solution of HCl already made. In this picture here, they are bubbling hydrogen chloride gas into water. And as you can see in the uh, magnified sketch on the bottom there, you can see that every single molecule of HCl has now ionized into hydronium and chloride ions. And you can see the equation in the bottom with a single forward arrow. Uh, there are many strong acids, but these are perhaps like what I call the magnificent seven. These are the seven most common strong acids that we use in the lab. And your task is to memorize them. So you need to memorize their names and their formulas and know that these seven are strong acids. To help you out, if you go to your Canvas uh, page, there is going to be a section there. I have the uh, URL here, but you should be able to find it in Canvas where I show you a video and they walk you through a trick, a, uh, like a method for memorizing these seven strong acids. So I encourage you to go there. Strong bases are also strong electrolytes. For example, sodium hydroxide, which is a solid crystal, when you dissolve it in the water, completely dissociates into hydroxide and sodium ions. And so you can see it in the bottom of the equation with a single forward arrow. Here are some of the strong bases that we know. These are pretty much substances that contain the hydroxide ion. Now, for the group 2A, uh, hydroxides like magnesium, calcium, and barium hydroxide. These are, uh, you know, not very soluble in water. So it's not like you can go and check the solution very easily, but you can show that they are basic because they will react with acids in acid-base reactions. Now, weak acids are weak electrolytes. As you can see here, when we dissolve uh, acidic acid in water, which is the solution that we refer to as vinegar. You'll notice in the picture here on the right, you can see that I'm going to show you here. I'm going to use my little highlighter. You can see that the majority of the acetic acid, you can barely see that. Let me change the color on that so you can see it a little better. You can see that the majority of the molecules of acetic acid uh, will remain unionized. You can see that little sphere on the oxygen still. Uh, there are some that are ionized. You can see them here with a negative charge. And then, of course, they produce a hydronium ions. So in this case, we have a partial ionization. That's why vinegar, solution of acidic acid, is a weak electrolyte. And because of that, when we write it, we write the equation with a double arrow. And that indicates it's reversible. And it also indicates that when we think about it chemically, we're going to have to deal with 
and some kind of an equilibrium constant. Here are some common weak acids. You can see there at the top, acidic acid, which is the uh, main component of vinegar. And then you can see some other ones like citric acid, which is a major component of citrus fruits. Uh, down there, lactic acid, which is found in milk. And there's many other ones that I have not put in here. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize these ones, all right? <laughs> and then some weak bases, some bases, I'm sorry, are weak. They are weak electrolytes, like ammonia. You can see the ionization of ammonia here on the bottom. Notice again, we're using a double arrow to indicate what happens when you put ammonia in water and the production of hydroxide ions. However, notice that in the picture, the majority of the ammonia molecules remain unionized, whereas just a few of them, a fraction of them, actually become ammonium and hydroxide ions. Here are some common weak bases I put in there, ammonia. There's other ones, uh, some of which are not very soluble. Calcium carbonate, of course, is a component of many anti-acids. Uh, then there's uh, several compounds that uh, are derivatives of ammonia where let's say one or more of the hydrogens in ammonia are replaced with carbon containing groups and these are called the amines and many of these uh, make up several substances that have very strong like fishy kind of smells like methylamine and trimethylamine as you can see it here all right again no you don't need to memorize any of these okay this has been a brief survey of the definitions of an acid and a base uh, we will use both the arrhenius and the uh, bronsted lowry definitions and the main thing that i want you to get out of this is that when you look at a chemical equation i want you to be able to a identify if a substance is an acid a reactant is an acid or a base Number two, whether you're looking at the reaction of a weak acid or a strong acid or a weak base or a strong base, based on whether you have a single forward arrow or a double arrow. Now we're going to go and look specifically at the behavior of weak acids.